Uh, hi everyone, this is, I'm Sebastian Handley and this is my video about um, chair design. A few years ago I made this table and the whole point of the table is it all bolts together with simple components so that if ever anything, part of it got broken it'd be easy to fix. And um, I was all very excited about that, I thought that was great. And uh, But that's um, that was about seven years ago and there's a different video on my channel about how to make that table. And so after I did that I tried to do chair designs and the first few I did were just sort of embarrassing failures so uh, I, I sort of gave up on that because it was too difficult because designing a chair is the hardest thing uh, out of any design challenge but then um, I did this sofa design here and the the sofa um, I just totally lucked out it everything just came into place and um, it's a, a it's a sofa bed there's a separate video on my um, channel on how to make the sofa but it's just um, it just everything came together and it worked really well that sofa design and so uh, that that was just uh, I just got very very lucky with that so I thought right okay I'm gonna have another try at the ultimate design challenge which is designing a chair and I thought I want to design something that's um, strong comfortable and light which is very very difficult to do if you've ever tried designing a chair you'll know how difficult it is and um, and so the uh, I've just finished it and so here it is. This is my chair design. It's the first time I've designed a chair that I'm not just embarrassed by. In fact, I would go further than that. And I would say that in the last hundred years, there's been about 20 chair designs that are any good. And this is one of them. And in this video, I'm going to explain uh, why it's so important. Now, chair design is all about what parameters you set yourself. So I wanted to do a chair that was light, strong and comfortable. Uh, but also where every single element could be reused, repaired, replaced or recycled. By who? By anyone. Even if you don't have any carpentry or upholstery skills. So we're going to take the cushions off and we'll come back to those later on. Now you see, it all looks pretty boring. It looks like a, a deck chair, but there's a reason why. It all bolts together like Meccano. Now, every single bit of wood you see is a standard timber section. Uh, you can just go to Travis Perkins or any timber yard and get these, um, these standard bits of wood. There are three types. So there's the slats, which are uh, 69 by 14 millimeters. Then there are these sticks, which are 20 by 33. So these sticks are used for the arms and the legs arms arms legs legs and also for the back of the chair here so the third bit of timber are these strong bits they're 69 by 21 and so there's only three different types of timber used uh, three different sections they're all standard sections so to get this um, arm all you've got to do is take a standard bit of timber and cut it twice and you've got it now um, there's only two types of fixings screws and bolts and uh, I'll come back to the cushions in a little while because that's a separate project. Also, one thing you'll notice is that every single element is a rectangle. So the only like so this that's a square cut there and there. The only exceptions I've allowed myself very very minor digressions for this, and the only exceptions is that the legs, the these are the shapes of these are actually parallelograms which means it's like a rectangle but squashed so that top corner of the leg is 95 degrees and that's 85 degrees 85 degrees 95 degrees so it's uh, it's sort of a rectangle but squashed because to get these legs they splay at five degrees very subtle but it gives the chair much more strength okay and then also back here um, these sections at the back, these back sections, uh, that cut there is uh, 100 degrees. So that's 100 degrees and that's 80 degrees. And so that's the only compromise I've had. Everything else, um, every single element is a rectangle. So here I want to show you what I haven't done. This is an Urkel chair that I've got. I really like Urkel, they're great. And so, but this is a really good example of what I haven't done with my design. Now you see Urkel have got this steamed bit of wood here for the back, which is great. They've got these spindles here and a separate type of spindle here that becomes more bulbous in the middle. They've got a nice big chunky bit here for the seat and these, um, these spindles for the legs, which are a thicker gauge than these spindles underneath that are used for stiffness. Okay, now so you see what Urkel are doing is they're doing something sophisticated. 
whenever they've got a different design challenge or the chair has to perform differently in different parts of the chair, they introduce a new element um, that is appropriate for that problem. Whereas what I've done, I've done the opposite. Instead of having a, a big suite of different types of materials, I have used the most minimal possible suite of materials I possibly could. Um, uh, so I, there's only three different sections of wood here, whereas with the Urkel, there are loads. And so I've done the opposite. I haven't gone for a sophisticated approach. I've gone for the, the, most, the most rude, the most elemental approach I possibly can. Okay, so now here is another example of what I haven't done. Now here are two chairs that we've got in the house because I like to have a range of chairs so I can copy from them and see what they're doing right and wrong. Then this is another Urkel chair, which is really nice. And this is an old, lovely um, Art Deco chair from, I think it was my wife's grandma's chair. And so now what you see with most chair design is that uh, most chair design, there are three basic elements. There is the primary structure, which is what holds you up. There is the finish that you touch, the material, and then there'll be an intermediate in between the finish and the primary structure, which gives you the softness. So here you might have springs or um, foam, stuff like that. And what you see with both of these chairs is that it's all integrated. So if you've got um, uh, where someone sits on this cushion again and again in the same place, it gradually wears out. And because it's all integrated, what do you do if part of it breaks? Uh, you have to go to an upholster, which is quite expensive. And mostly people won't bother to do that. They'll just throw the chair in the landfill site, which is exactly what I want to avoid happening. Now, I think a chair should be like a bicycle or a guitar. Now, if a string breaks on a guitar, you replace a string. You don't throw away the guitar and get a whole new guitar because the string's broken, right? And with a bicycle, if a bicycle breaks, then what you do is you, uh, if, if you get a puncture, you repair the puncture. You don't throw away the whole bike and get a whole new bike because you've got a puncture. And that's the thing with all furniture. All furniture, if something breaks, you should be able to repair locally rather than replace generally. That's the important thing. And with this, every single element can be, um, every single element can be repaired locally by anyone, even if you have no carpentry skills and no upholstery skills whatsoever. That is the important thing. So here's an example. What if this leg were to break, right? You see, you've broken this leg. Well, you go to Travis Perkins and you get a new bit of timber that's 20 millimeters by 33 millimeters. It's a standard size and you just cut it and substitute it in. Now, how will you know exactly how to cut it and exactly where to drill these holes? Well, simple. You just take the leg off the other side and draw around it with a felt tip. So you use that leg as a jig. You take this leg off, you put it on the bit of timber, you draw a line for the, the top angle, and you'll draw a line for the bottom angle. You'll do a dot where the two holes are that you've got to um, put the bolts through. And then anyone can replace the leg of the chair because um, all you have to do is be able to use a felt tip, cut a line with a saw twice and make a, a five millimeter hole with a drill. That's all you have to do to repair a leg. Now, if a leg broke on one of those chairs, they'd be in landfill. If 10% if of that chair were to break, 100% of that chair would go into a landfill site. That's the problem. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the structure. Um, the whole thing obviously bolts together like Meccano. Now, there's two types of um, strength that we're getting here. First of all, a good piece of structure is one where you get the maximum structural strength with the minimum possible structure. And so what I've got is, I've got double fixings here and double fixings here, which give it some strength. And I've got this triangulation here, which gives it some strength. One of them on their own wouldn't be enough, but if you use both of them together, it makes it enormously strong. And now, uh, if we look at, say, for example, we go back to this chair, you've got these, these braces underneath. They're only performing one job. They're only just giving the chair stiffness. I don't like that. Uh, Urkel is fantastic, but we've got another thing around here with this chair. We've just got this brace here, and it's just giving the chair stiffness. It's doing no other job. Now, what I like is something where every element, we get the maximum we can out of every single one. So where the legs are splayed, they are partly acting like columns, but they're partly acting like buttresses. And so they're mostly columns because they're mostly straight, but they're slightly, um, they're, 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 they're slightly tilted, which makes this triangle bigger and it gives 
this more of an angle. It, it, um, it gives it a, a, a diagonal, a triangulation that increases the strength. And so, um, and so apart from that, if we look at the slats, the slats aren't just taking uh, the weight of the, the body, they're also giving stiffness in another way. So they're not just taking the, the cushions in your weight, they're also doing something else. These slats, because I've got two screws either side, the slats on the seat are stopping the chair from creaking that way. And the slats on the back, because they've got the same thing there, they're stopping the chair from creaking that way. So every single element of the chair, I'm trying to get to do several jobs. So these legs, they're not simply legs that support the chair, they're also legs that keep the cushions in place. So when I put the cushions in, the reason why they're in the right place and they don't fall all over the place, is because the legs keep them there. You see? Now, if we look at the slats for the seat, you'll notice there are one, two, three, four slats for the seat because they, they are doing the most work. They're taking the weight of the body. Whereas for the back, there's only one, two, three slats because they're not performing such a structural load. You only need three. And if you look at the slats, you see I've, I carefully tried it with all different sections of timber. I went to Travis Perkins and I measured the section of every single standard bit of timber they've got. And I kept using different ones and massaging it this way and that way to get it right and to use the, the, the most appropriate section timber in the right situation. And you'll see that all of these slats, they, this is the primary structure, the leg and the strong bit, and the legs and the back and the arm, that's the primary structure. And the slats, you'll notice that they sail past to not clash. That's because I wanted these screws to be away from the end grain. If these screws are too near the end grain, it will lose strength. And so it's no accident that these slats over sail past the primary structure. You see, they're coming at this one here. I don't know if you can see because it's quite dark. See this one here, it goes underneath the arm. That one there goes over the arm. It's no accident. That's, um, uh, I, I redesigned it again and again and again so that the, the slats dance a waltz around the primary structure. The primary structure is an N there and an L that bolts to it. Now, when we look at this lovely Urkel chair, we see that this spindle is dialed in here and into the base and here. You see that? Now, that takes a, a good carpenter, a serious bit of carpentry. And obviously, I want my joints to be the opposite of that. I want my joints to be completely moronic, very, very dumb. Right, no carpentry skills whatsoever. So I've, I've not permitted myself the use of any dovetail joints or Moritz and tenon joints, anything like that. So that up there is just a straight cut across. And so obviously I'm going to need um, something or these straps to pull the whole thing together because if you look under here for example, right, if you get the fixings too close to the end grain they become very weak and so I can't have all of the joints, bits of wood over sailing past one another to bolt through just to avoid fixing at the end. So what do I do when I get the end grain of a bit of wood and it's got to abut the middle of another bit of wood? Well, I've gone for these straps because that's the most dumb, the most moronic possible metal fixing that I can use. A bracket has an angle. Or uh, I looked at P-clips, I looked at threaded bar, all sorts of other things. But you can't get any simpler than a rectangle with some holes drilled in it. And so that's the, the these straps, that is the basic thing I've done to hold the chair together so that I can make um, fixings at the end of, uh, at the end grain of a bit of wood. Okay, so now we come to the cushions again, and you see, I'm going to go back to these examples. You see this, where you always sit in the same place on this chair, gradually the material starts to fall apart. And that's going to happen here as well one day. Um, we've only had that re-upholstered about sort of a year ago, so it's okay. But when you always repeatedly sit and wear the cushion in the same place, that cushion's always going to wear out. Now, what have I done about that here? Well, these cushions, you'll see, they are symmetrical. They are straight rectangles. So they're as simple as possible. And um, because they're symmetrical, look at this. That one slots in there. And this one, well, that's a different one. So that one slots in there. And that one slots in there. Right, so now imagine that that bit of material wore out. Well, it's symmetrical. So if that bit of material wore out, we've got cut or something, you can flip it over. 
and if that bit of material wore out you can flip it over that way you see and then what if so there like that and if that side wore out you could flip the cushions around because they're both the cushions are exactly the same shape so that one you could take out i'm trying to do this one-handed by the way so then you could substitute them around so you can always keep the best face of the best cushion facing outwards so that you don't have to um so you you don't have to sort of reupholster every few years the dimensions of the cushions are 18 inches across 16 inches deep and one and a half inches thick that is 38 millimeters by 406 millimeters by 457 millimeters okay now here are the early versions of the cushions that i did to make sure i got it just right now so this is like um fake leather which is good because if you cut it it means you don't have to hem it you could just cut the shape and it's not going to fray and so uh and so that's a nice bit of um that's a nice material to use now this if you look at this how do i do the cushion well i don't want to do anything that requires any sort of upholstery skill whatsoever i've got to do it so that any idiot can do it and so here is um a bit of foam and here is the cover I'll turn it over so it's easier to see but basically it's just one single piece of material because I want to keep it as simple as possible there's a single piece of material and I've got holes in it so you don't even have to sew what you do is you just lace it up like a boot and so you get your rectangles of foam and you get one single piece of material and you can just run a bit of cord or string through all of the holes to lace it up and it all wraps up like a Christmas present. So imagine with this chair, what if that one was to get torn um, and you need to replace it? Well, simple. What you do is you unlace this cover, you get a new bit of material, you put that cover over the top, you draw around it with a felt tip, you cut it out with a pair of scissors and then you lace it and wrap it like a Christmas present. And so anyone, even without any skills, if you've if you can use a pair of scissors and a felt tip you can re-upholster your own furniture now there's different densities of foam that's a very very thick one and this the bit of foam i've got in here is much more squidgy and so it depends because what the the two bits of foam are going to be performing different jobs with this one you want it as soft as possible but not so soft that your bum feels the slats because that's uncomfortable whereas with the back it's a bit easier you can afford to have it a bit softer so the bit of foam for the seat that you're going to need is about 96 kilograms per meter cubed whereas the bit of foam for the back you can get away with about 52 kilograms kilograms per meter cubed so the seat's got to be about twice as dense as the back but you've got to remember this is just a straight rectangle of foam um, and so it's never going to break um, what's ever going to go wrong with a, a simple bit of rectangular foam like that. Um, I get my foam from AnyFoam, um, it's a company called AnyFoam. I'll put a link to it in the blurb underneath if you're interested. Right, so, so basically these cushion covers are a single piece of leather that are just sort of done up like uh, laces in a boot. Um, I don't like using leather because I'm a vegetarian, but I had this leather that was in the attic for like 15 years. Um, there's a project I was meant to do like decades ago and I never got around to it. So I had this leather, so I thought I'd use that. If I was going to do it again, obviously I'd use sort of like artificial leather like this because it's just as good. But um, anyway, so I've done this set of leather and it's a single piece of leather. And you see I've put the lace going all the way around. And then at the end, I just tie it up with a bow the way I tie up a shoelace and I tuck it in to the slot there. And that goes there, nice and finished. So, so design is all about balance. There's no such thing as an ultimate chair because there's, uh, there's different shaped people, different shapes and sizes, different occasions where you'd use a chair, different things you'd use a chair for. Sometimes you'd want a formal chair. Sometimes you'd want a, 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 just a, a lounge chair. And people come in all different shapes and sizes. And also when you sit in a chair, you, um, when you sit in a chair, you adjust your position all the time. If you sit in a chair, the chances are you're going to shuffle around, move your weight from one side to the other every couple of minutes. And so there's no such thing as a, uh, uh, um, a, an ultimate chair because you can change a chair's sort of mood by making it lower, makes it more loungy, making it higher, makes it more formal. And so I've tried to get balance also 
in the aesthetics. I wanted to do something that was halfway in between like a peasant chair and a, a chair that you'd have if you were going to sit at a dining table or a desk if working in an office. I wanted it to be uh, universal, sort of applicable to as many different domestic situations as possible for as many people in as many different situations as possible. So I could make the chair lighter, but not without compromising it in lots of other ways where I don't want to compromise it. So for example, if I wanted to, I could have these slats on the back thinner because they're doing less of a structural job than the slats down here. But then that would mean there'd be four types of wood instead of three. So I've tried to, uh, so I could make it better in some ways, but not without compromising it in a way that I didn't want to in other ways. And so it's another example in which chair design is all about balance. It's, uh, unless you've actually done chair design yourself and you realize how difficult it is, it's hard to explain. But um, there's all sorts of trade-offs you've got to make. Right, so, is this chair comfortable? Let's see. Well, I'm making this video on my own, so uh, yeah, I think it's really comfortable. I'm five foot ten. I've had sort of um, it's comfy for my mum who's little, and I've had someone six foot sit in it before. Is it strong? I try. It's a bit difficult to lean back on it, but obviously when you lean back on a chair, it performs totally different structural tasks, things that were in tension now are working in compression, stuff like that. But it's pretty difficult to lean back because because the back legs. Both of the legs are spaced five degrees, so it's hard to sort of lean back. But yeah, it's strong, it's comfortable, and it's, you know, slight. Um, and so it, it succeeds in what I wanted it to do. Now there's one obvious way in which this chair is a total failure, and maybe you've spotted it already, maybe you haven't, but this chair is a total failure in terms of capitalism. Like, so say you were a chair manufacturer, and you started manufacturing this chair, well, you want people to come to you to buy the chair. You don't want them being able to get the chair from someone else, you know, undercutting you or anything like that. And the thing is, each chair is a diagram of how to make other chairs. I've deliberately gone out of my way to make sure every single part of the chair is very, very forgeable. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world to make knockoffs of it. And, and, and that's the whole point of it. Um, and so that's, um, that's the way in which this chair will be a, a complete catastrophe because um, who, how are you going to make any money by selling them? If you buy one, then someone could just sort of go out and make a load more. Um, that's the whole point of the design. But the economic argument for the chair isn't totally rubbish because let's look at it this way. Imagine you had a restaurant and you had 30 chairs and one of them broke. Well, you wouldn't need to go out and buy another chair to replace it. You'd only need to buy another part of a chair. And that's the whole point of it. Now let's look at that in another way. I've seen estimates that on planet Earth there are between 20 and 100 billion chairs. And in a hundred years, most of those chairs will be in a landfill site, which is an absolute waste and it's a big waste. Now, what if a hundred years ago, at say the Bauhaus, some genius like Marcel Brewer had designed a chair like this? Well, if he had, then maybe today the chair industry wouldn't exist at all because you wouldn't need to buy chairs anymore. You'd only need to buy parts of chairs because if any part of any chair broke, anybody could fix it. Now, if you're very eagle-eyed, you will have spotted that this strap is different to these two. That was an early design thing that I got wrong. I tried making it with these short straps, but they didn't really work in that situation. Um, but this is just a Mark 1. In the Mark 2, I'm going to standardise, have the longer straps. Um, that will make it stronger. I'm going to um, avoid making it heavier by omitting these straps on the inside here. So there'll just be a longer strap here instead. If you have a longer strap as well, also it means that you can avoid um, clashes with these screws. You see, I've got these screws here. These screws, I've slightly edged some of the screws across because I didn't want to clash with these bolts. If I use a longer strap, it won't matter so much. I can use a longer strap here and I can use a standard slat. See, this is a standard slat. The screws are the same distance from the edge. 
here I've had to slightly vary it because I didn't want it to clash with these bolts. But if I use a longer strap, that won't be the case. It means it allows me to make it even more dumb, even more of a one liner, which is what I'm trying to do, trying to make it as dumb as possible. And so that will be what I do in my Mark 1. And so that is a bit of a compromise um, and I will sort that out in the Mark 2. But the important thing here is that the, the great breakthrough has, done, has been done. I've proved that it's possible to do a chair that's light, comfortable and strong where every single element of it can be repaired, reused, replaced or recycled by anybody, even if they have very, very basic skills and tools. Okay, so here's a book on chairs that I've sort of referred to. I've got loads of books on chairs. I'm always interested in it. This is a Le Corbusier chair, fantastic, obviously. Corby's just genius. Um, but the one thing I would say is, note the way it's very heavy and it doesn't express the um, the means of construction. Obviously, that, that's the design, that's the, the whole point of the chair. But it's maybe part of a problem that Corb, the person that designs it, isn't the same person as the person that makes it. That's the whole thing with Corb. And then say we go to Mrs. Famous Barcelona chair. It's a sculpture that you can sit in, but it's actually not a very comfy chair. I've got to say, uh, Barcelona chair is, uh, uh, again, it's very, very heavy. And if you look at these joints, they don't express the means of construction. The, the joint is, uh, is brushed down and uh, the weld is, is brushed away and filed away so that it looks totally smooth. Um, and say, say, say we take um, another brilliant chair. This is the Rietveld chair. Again, it's it's a fantastic work of genius, but it's very, very heavy and it doesn't express the means of construction. So look at this armrest here and it just butts up to this stick that's underneath. Now, how is, does that stick fix to that armrest? Well, either the joint is very weak or else there's some sort of fixing in there that Rietveld was trying to keep secret that he doesn't want us to know about. Um, but th this is the, the, the problem. The whole point of the modernist movement should have been that it brought, used machine and mass production to bring great design to the masses of people. And if that was the case, then why isn't there a Rietveld chair in every house? Why isn't there a Corb chair in every house? Why isn't there a Mies chair in every house? And the, 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 the work is, is great, they're geniuses, but it's very heavy and they don't express the means of construction. And they, they've ended up doing chairs, which is the opposite of what they said they were about. They've ended up, these, these are chairs for millionaires. They're not chairs for just sort of, uh, that you could put in a, a, a cafe or, uh, or just having your house in, you know, in, in your front room or something like that. There's the Mies chair again. Okay, and so with Mies, he actually had to sort of design a pavilion for the chair to go in. That's the, that's the whole thing that I wanted to avoid with my project. Okay, and here it is from underneath, and there's my little message I wrote. If anyone ever turns this chair upside down to have a look at it, I've written Sebastian Handley, 2021, March, Universal Chair. Everything I make is a monument how to live, Mark 1. Okay, so that's my video. I hope um, I've explained it clearly. I'm just trying to, uh, I'll just try and sum up. So, um, so what I've tried to do is I've tried to design the Universal Chair. Um, I've tried to design a chair that is every, pretty much everything you would need from any situation. So I wanted a chair that was light, comfortable and strong, where every single element could be repaired, reused, recycled or replaced by anybody. And I wanted a chair that is applicable to all sorts of um, situations or domestic settings. And so um, what I wanted to do, I saw a, a documentary on how Johnny Marvis redesigned the Fender Jaguar. And he's absolutely done a number on it. Obviously, he's thought to himself, I want to totally end the conversation about what is the best guitar. I'm going to make the Fender Jaguar, the, my Fender Jaguar, the greatest guitar ever. And I thought, yeah, that, that's what you have to do with all design. You have to, you have to, you, ha you have to just completely look at finishing the project so that there, so there isn't any more for someone else to come on and pick holes in later on but I hope that's of interest if you've um if you've got any comments put them underneath and I'll try to help you out um if you're interested in making one yourself with things like the, the pattern for the fabric um I can send you a, a pdf if you want if you want to have a go at making one uh you could print the the, the pattern out on an a o bit of paper and then cut around it to get the the covering for the cushions the right shape I hope that's of interest and um, I'm very proud that I've done a good job. Thank you.
Oh, hi there. Okay, hi. So this is where I work, and I'm at my machine now. Um, right, so obviously, I'm just going to just show you a bit of my method, because, um, uh, not so that people can rip me off, but just so that uh, it might be of interest to any people out there tr um, interested in a similar sort of project. I would just want to disseminate as much knowledge to as many people as I possibly can. Now, obviously, I've filled up loads and loads of sketchbooks with literally hundreds of designs, and whenever I had a new design, I would draw it up again from scratch and we see there's hundreds here and all of these are DWGs of lots of other chairs so I see what level everybody else does their seat at and their armrest things like that and I get all the different chair designs I can uh, so so I can compare mine to all everyone else and then you see here as I develop the design and change the design I do a new section every time the whole thing is designed on section and so here I went into Travis Perkins and measured the sections of every single bit of wood that they sell that's a standard size. So I thought, right, that is my um, suite of materials that I'm going to use for making a chair. And so anyway, so as we go further along to the right, it becomes more developed. I try different wood sections, things like that. And you see we're getting closer and closer to the, the final one where I was confident enough about it to actually go and make it. And so here we are. This is, we are now at the end where I'm just working out the pattern for the, the wrapping. And this is the final Mark 1. So that was my um, final design that I went into production with. So, uh, and that is the template for the bit of material. Uh, da, 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 da. So, um, right, so they, these are the basic elements. There is the slat, which we know is 70 by 14. And the important thing with the slat is that they're, they're 510 long, but the screws have to be 442 apart or else the cushion won't fit. Now we've got the legs. Now the front legs, I've broken this down here. So, so these are the elements of the chair that I've just moved over here and put some dimensions on just to show you roughly how it works. Th these are the back legs and these are the front legs over here. And the back legs and the front legs are exactly the same shape. They're both 604 long, and you see there's the slight angle. They're five millimeters from the, five degrees from the perpendicular here. So at the back, we've got 280 mil. Then you've got your first five mil hole, 41 mil. Then you've got your next five mil hole, and then you've got 283 to the end. That's the back leg. The front leg, same shape again, 239 to the first five millimeter hole. Then 40 mil to the first five millimeter hole, and then. 325 to the end you see so they're both the same shape but they've just got holes in different places there's the armrest it's 584 long 53 millimeters to the first hole 110 to the hole just by where your hand is so that's where your hand will go at this bit here i'm only showing the holes for um that are set i'm not giving the holes for that go into all of the rest of the the straps because you might have different types of straps in your part of the world you're where you buy metal fixings from they might have holes at different centers so i'm not going to bother with that this is the stick for the backrest um in yellow and the dimensions are in white and you see it's got 10 degrees from the perpendicular here uh it's 404 long on one side and 398 the other side this obviously is 33 by 20 just like the the leg and the arm and the back leg and this is the strong bit of wood. I just call it the strong bit because it's the beefiest. All of the holes are 15 millimeters from the edge. It's a rectangle of wood that is 605 long. At the front, the holes are 90 millimeters from the front. And at the back, this hole is 43 millimeters from the back. And this hole is 36 millimeters from the back. I'm showing you this just for interest. I want to just disseminate knowledge. I'm not doing this because I want to get ripped off or people to so, you know, I don't know. I don't, don't want to make. I don't want some multinational tax dodger to sort of produce billions of these and just uh, not give me any money. <laughs> but I'm just saying this is how I did it, and that's my final mug one. Hope that's of interest.